Welcome to episode 7 of the Nimbus podcast. This week, Adrian, the musical director at Nimbus Records, talked to arranger, conductor, and general musical expert Kenneth Woods at his home in Cardiff. Conversation started quickly, so I was a little late to turn the mic on. So for any new listeners, Adrian Farmer, the musical director, is the first to speak. As always, a playlist of all the music in the podcast will be linked below. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, iTunes, and YouTube for any updates on future podcasts or future episodes in general otherwise i hope you enjoy what i found a very wide-ranging and engaging conversation on all aspects of music enjoy if i said to you thea musgrave what does it what does it mean for you ken i first encountered thea musgrave's music in boston i went to see the boston symphony i was visiting my sister who lives in town there they were doing Enigma Variations with Andrew Davis, and Phoenix Rising was on the same ah, concert. Right. And, uh, it was the premiere. Yeah, fantastic. Right. Absolutely fantastic work. I was blown away at the, the depth of craftsmanship, the mastery of the orchestra, the sense of form and architecture, and the, the, the way in which the music carries itself forward. And, you know, her language is very compelling. You know, it's quite a broad, eclectic language, but... Uh, Somehow there's a, an inner sense of harmonic purpose to it, which, which carries it forward really compellingly. And then uh, very early on when I joined the English String Orchestra, one of the first projects we did was something called Wall of Water, which led to uh, our first recording with me for Nimbus Alliance uh, with Deborah Pritchard's concerto of the same name. And for the concert uh, premiere of Deborah's uh, concerto, we paired it with uh, three other works by women composers, uh, Emily Doolittle's Falling Still, which also ended up on, on the same recording, uh, uh, an event for morning in East London, Kaya Sariajo's Terra Memoria, and Green by Thea Musgrave, which I think is also a super piece, and you know, very much a different sound world from Phoenix Rising. This is for a very, very small string hmm. ensemble, really a, a little team of soloists. Uh, it's just intensely divided string writing so everything is quite exposed and it's sort of music of extremes you know it starts with uh, music that's about as lovely as it can get which is quickly juxtaposed with music that's about as ugly as it can get and the loveliness and the ugliness keep pushing further and further apart from each other and reaches an amazing point of crisis uh, and, and then resolves uneasily the there's end. never there's never any padding or waffle in Thea's music is there that's what I find it's extremely well crafted and you don't find yourself thinking well I could have done without those 10 bars that really didn't get me anywhere yeah and in the odd instance where you think something has gone on autopilot then it's probably time to think again uh, and it was nice for us that we've we've done the piece three times now and coming back to it when you can have a little bit more time to go in and sort of more forensic detail in, into some of the more complex passages and help the players maybe hear how they're constructed a bit, uh, I think the music gets stronger and stronger. Do you agree with the statement she made herself um, from, from, from the point of view of being a conductor and having to work with an orchestra or a large group? Thea has always, I think, believed and has said, you can make the effect of the music as complicated as you want, but you have to ensure that your craft as, as a composer makes it possible for each individual player to understand what they're doing and to be able to achieve it very quickly. So she's, she is definitely saying, if as a composer you make something so complicated that the performer can't actually either understand it or get to grips with it almost immediately that you have failed your craft. I completely agree and uh, I mean there's an awful lot of music of all eras but particularly our own that seems to espouse almost the opposite aesthetic you know there must be a harder way to do it Mm. Um, and uh, that takes away all of the agency and the creativity of the performer it's very alienating and, and very frustrating. And it also sort of takes away any incentive to do what I was just describing us doing in green, which is to dig deeper and to try and figure out, you know, what happens if 
we figure out how these two lines really work with each other. Um, if if things are composed in such a way that all you can ever do is hold on for dear life, yeah. yes, um, it, it, it's it's very alienating, and I, I think it speaks to a certain lack of confidence about the material and what you're trying to say. Mm. Um, so mm. I, I mean, bless her for mm. espousing that. She and, and I. I well, I'm, I'm glad you, you you find that as a as a working conductor, that's true. Because when I look at her scores, even in silence, you can see immediately the transparency of the scores. Mm. Each individual line is quite clear. It's perfectly obvious what has to be done. Even though when you stand back and listen to it without the score, you you are ama- amazed and excited in equal measure by the apparent. Um, complexity of the craft, yet individual lines are really very easy to follow. Yeah, uh, I find that with her, I love it. I wonder, you know, she's. Uh, I saw an interview with her about Green, in which she talks about working with Hans Gall as a as a student, and uh, very very different musical language. But mm. you know, uh, for him, the whole point of composition was originality of thought, having something new to say, as opposed to originality of means, which is, is very limiting. And, and, you know, if your idea of originality of means is, you know, 17 over 5, then, you know, what's next, 19 over 5? I mean, at some point you say, well, what's the point? You know, it just, it yeah. just, just sounds very dense and yeah. complicated. Yeah. And, and is it really original anymore? I'm not, not so sure. Uh, she's very grounded in, uh, you know, harmony, counterpoint, motivic approach to composition and a very lyric approach too when required yeah. the, op- the opera is a, an example of that there is nothing in Mary Queen of Scots that is um, is unlyrical it's, it's, it's easy to sing um, certainly for a contemporary opera easy to sing mm. and easy to listen to um, I don't know why it's fallen a little bit out of favour on the stage. Perhaps it was too popular in its in its time when it was first performed in the late 70s. Because um, it certainly did have a lot of performances. But this particular recording, which is a live one um, from the American premiere, um, I hope will will revive yeah. the fortunes of the piece. <laughs> moment I mean she's having a moment which is great and, and mm. wonderful to see some very richly deserved recognition for a prolific life as a composer and uh, I think the piece is very compelling and uh, effective bit of theater and uh, you know that's what opera companies need so yeah. hopefully having it available will help you know generate the audience that the companies need in order to have the confidence to program these things just going a little bit to the side I wonder if a British observer has a different view to an American observer, if I can call you that, um, of why somebody like Thea would leave the UK and go to America. The, the, the general perception in this country has always been that the 60s and 70s became a bad time for native composers in this country because the BBC, as the establishment figure in classical music, turned away from what it saw as a British pastoral tradition and wanted to bring in more mainstream European mm-hmm. um, energy. So the, the, the successors of Vaughan Williams um, were, were abandoned for the avant-garde of Stockhausen and Henzer and so on. Mm-hmm. And that a number of British composers found that that was too difficult to live with and decamped. Um, not, not only British composers, but you think of uh, Goldschmidt, Gall, I mean, any number of, of Veles, 
you know, these emigre composers who were steeped in the Central European tradition, embodied it. They were the last representatives of it, you know, and, and at the ends of their careers, they were struggling to find performances of their music. And that wasn't true in the 40s and 50s when they first came here. You know, they were immediately integrated into musical life and their music was played on the BBC and, and played by the major orchestras. Right. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't, for, yes, what you're saying is mm -hmm. quite true, actually. It wasn't just the native British people who found it difficult in the 60s and 70s. It was the people who were part of any of the long established traditions um, whether they be French or German or British, who found in the UK a rather shifting sand, some rather shifting sands of, of wanting more, um, more experimental. And nothing music. wrong with experimental music. And, you know, at least the BBC as an institution always had the resources to give new and challenging music a chance to be played to a high standard, which is a good thing. But what you don't want is a sort of monoculture where only one language mm. is allowed or only one uh, style of music is, is heard. And I think uh, it did a lot of damage for audiences because uh, on the one hand, there was this sort of message going out to listeners saying, you know, if you come to the Mahler, you'll really enjoy this new piece, knowing that they wouldn't because the aesthetic is totally different. And, you know, the aesthetic might be appealing to someone who is more of a sort of ensemble into contemporary kind of listener than a Mahler fan. And it's that kind of dishonesty is quickly seen through by, yes. by audiences. And do you imagine that the attractiveness of America was simply that that, that mono, that approach to a monoculture, which is possible in a country like the UK where the BBC is so dominant or were dominant was simply not possible in America. You you didn't have to be pigeonholed in America. Is that why it was an attractive place to go? I'm not sure because I mean there was certainly a similar moment, you know, in which uh, especially in terms of the academic world, you know, American universities and conservatories, you know, if you weren't writing twelve tone music, you weren't getting tenure, you weren't getting grants, you okay. weren't advancing professionally. Um, I mean that said there's a lot of ways to make a career in a big country. And, yeah. and uh, you know, I think she, she did it largely outside the academy as, as just a working professional mm. composer. Mm. But I also think as someone who's, you know, left America to come here, you know, the, the process of relocating can be uh, very creatively stimulating in all sorts also, of other yes. ways. And, and it might have just been for her that being in New York, you know, mm. was inspiring. Be sad. Can we not cheer you? I guess we should talk about your own record before uh, <laughs> before we get stuck into the others. So I don't want to leave you to last. Why did the world need an orchestration of the uh, Brahms Piano Quartet? I don't know. The world does need it. <laughs> I mean, uh, funnily enough, uh, you know, a few years ago I recorded. A wonderful orchestration of the Elgar Piano Quintet by my friend Donald Fraser. Um, and one review said something along those very lines, this is an unnecessary arrangement. Well, right. art is always, by definition, unnecessary. It's why we struggle to fund it. But it's also necessary, and it's hard to explain why it is. But, 
you know, we feel when there's an absence of it in our lives. And uh, somehow the little voice that says create is one that, you know, you ignore at your own peril. And uh, for me, the idea for the arrangement came very spontaneously. It's not something I'd ever considered doing. Uh, uh, as I mentioned in the liner notes for the CD, I was actually coaching the piece with a, a group of musicians in Italy, and the pianist was playing the beginning of the piece in a kind of rather over-earnest and wooden manner, and I said, you know, you've got to have a, a poetic concept. Imagine it's a quartet of hunting horns. And uh, I thought, oh, that would actually sound rather good. And uh, then as the coaching session went on, just it was almost as if someone had hit play on a recording and an orchestral version of the piece started making itself up in my head. And uh, you know, over time, I just thought, well, this would be a really interesting thing to attempt to do. Uh, I can remember uh, when I was at Indiana University in the 1980s talking to a friend of mine who's now a very, very eminent American composer who I will do the great favor of not naming. And he said, uh, as only a 19-year-old composer can say, oh, Brahms was a terrible orchestrator. You know, no one would orchestrate like that anymore. We know so much more about the orchestra. <coughs> but I found working on this project uh, something that I already knew, which is that you know, he was an absolute genius orchestrator. And uh, to try and understand what in his language is about putting forward the material in the clearest way and what is about coloring the material in the most attractive way is not at all obvious. And you can be too opulent, you can be too earnest, you can be too square. It's finding that balance because he is a very romantic composer and a very classical composer. Yes, the orchestration is interesting. And I think you've done a, a really extremely idiomatic job. I don't know whether idiomatic was what you were after, um, but it doesn't sound to me respectful, but it certainly sounds the way Brahms might quite believably have done it. Well, that was the goal. Um, I'm sure many listeners and, and critics will make comparisons with Schoenberg's arrangement of Opus 25, yeah. uh, which comes at it from an almost diametrically opposite point of view, which is to have as much fun with it as, as possible in a very irreverent way. Um, Although we know Schoenberg was extremely loved the piece. respectful of Brahms. I mean, loved him. Worshipped yeah, him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely worshipped him. Um, and in a way, the whole dodecophonic approach to composition grows out of his study of Brahms' approach to motivic development. Uh, so nothing but, but love there. Um, but strangely, I just feel like, I mean, there's the things that are obviously humorous and silly, like the, the use of the xylophone in the last movement. Um, in the Schoenberg. In the Schoenberg. Yeah. Uh, those bother me less than just, I feel like there's quite a few things in, in the earlier movements of the piece that just, maybe with all the admiration in the world for Schoenberg, a hero of mine, I don't feel like he quite lived with it long enough mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. the process of doing it. And uh, I was able to do a sort of warm-up performance of the arrangement uh, in 2015, and then we recorded it in 2017, and being able to do that and figure out where the mistakes were and and, uh, and rebalance it a little bit it was incredibly mm. helpful mm. For I'm me. sure
help, um, if not necessary, one thing it can offer is for all my dear colleagues in orchestras all over the world for whom Brahms is one of the most beloved cornerstones of our repertoire, something else to play. Mm, yes. Uh, you know, he gave us four of the greatest symphonies ever written. Uh, this is a work of similar scope and ambition. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, if, if that means that every once in a while, you know, someone gets to play another 50 minutes of, of vintage orchestral Brahms, then I think you know that that's a, a good enough reason to have done it. I, I agree with you. Yes. What's what's wrong with another piece of Brahms? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. No. Very good. Is that uh, the end of your ambitions to make arrangements of Brahms or of others, or is it something you think you've now you've um, got a taste for? I very much have a taste for it. Yeah. I mean, I think it has to have its own internal motivation. To, to do it. I, I think you can't just sit down and think what would be popular uh, because I, I think that's the wrong reason. Uh, I did do an orchestration of Victor Ullmann's Third String Quartet, uh, which the English Chamber Orchestra and David Perry recorded a few years ago. I'm very proud of that arrangement. And earlier this year for the ESO, we did Erwin Stein's chamber version of Mahler IV. And for the first half of that concert, I did a number of arrangements for the same forces as the Steins or string quints had a few winds, harmonium, piano, and, and percussion. And uh, that was a really fascinating project, and it did occur to me while I was doing it that it could be the basis of a very interesting recording. Also, uh, we did uh, the uh, Der Kleine Sandmann from uh, Hansel and Gretel, which of course has similar themes of children in nature and that f complex and fragile relationship. Um, I transcribed Mahler's own earthly life for the same forces. Of course, it, the fourth symphony ends with the heavenly life, and those two songs, uh, one about need and want and one about contentment and peace, uh, are, are very compelling mirrors of each other. And then I had a lot of fun with Schubert with the other two. Uh, I transcribed The Trout and Death and the Maiden, but rather than just arranging the songs, uh, I mixed together the songs with the variations he later wrote for chamber ensemble. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the trout, um, we take uh, each verse of the song and intersperse it with one or more of the variations, which takes a little bit of harmonic sleight of hand because they're not all in the same key and a little bit of figuring out how to make some transitions. But I had a lot of fun with it. And then in the case of Death and the Maiden, I, I orchestrated the string quartet movement that's based on that song. And it, that goes without a break, beginning to end, and then ends with the song, accompanied by this very strange sound world, that sort of salon orchestra uh, that, that Stein and Schoenberg uh, were writing for in the Society for Private Musical Performances. So who knows? There, there could be, be other things, too. I've had a long-standing desire to do an orchestration of the Bloch for a string quartet, which a little bit like the Elgar piano quintet, a little bit like the, the Brahms piano quartet, is such a big work, it almost uh, cries out for, for bigger forces. I mean, it is uh, Bloch's view of the whole world at that stage of his life. Brahms leads us on to Brühl, mm. um, just in the same way that I said to you, you know, what does Thea Musgrave mean? You might say to me, what does Ignaz Brühl mean? And prior to actually putting this record into our catalogue, I would have shrugged my shoulders and said, I think I've heard of him. Um, I, I wouldn't have been at all ahead of you, to be honest. Yeah, uh, I've, I've seen the name here and there, but never listened to any of it. How does that happen? How does somebody who was 
a close friend of Brahms, somebody whom Brahms admired and spent time with. How do they disappear off the musical map so completely that you and I, who between us have probably more than 100 years of listening to music, would say, I think I've read the name? Yeah. There's a lot from that generation. There certainly are, yes. And there's even a lot of music by composers we know much better. I mean, one of the comparisons that came to mind listening to the Brule was Max Bruch, Mm -hmm. you know, who wrote three real cornerstone, super famous works, the the first fiddle concerto, the the, uh, Scottish fantasy and the Col Nidre, but, you know, there's an enormous amount of other really fine music that's completely forgotten. But other composers of that generation, like Robert Kahn, you know, completely forgotten yes. and, and overlooked. Um, is it is it nature finding an appropriate level? In other words, are these composers who actually, for various reasons, were popular in their time um, and were probably good uh, personalities, but whose music ultimately is worthless and therefore nature has said, well, we're not going to let that one survive? Or is it our fault that... Concert promoters um, are not inclined to program things that are not well known, and that, of course, feeds on itself like a like a computer algorithm. You know, mm-hmm. you, you you spiral into into insignificance. Can we say that Brule is not interesting? It, would that would that be would that be fair? Is that accurate? I don't think we can say one way or the other until the music gets more performances, uh, because it's very hard, even for professional musicians, I think, to differentiate between inadequate music and inadequate performances. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think uh, for me, the process of getting to grips with the music of Hans Gall, which was completely unknown when I got started on mm-hmm. the orchestral music, one of the things I quickly realized was that. Almost all of the air checks and archival recordings that were passed on to me were so awful and so boring that you couldn't imagine on the basis of listening to that that there was a good piece in there waiting to be found. Um, I really like the violin concerto on on this. I I think that's a, a really strong piece. I think one of the reasons that it may have jumped out at me more strongly than some of the other works It's just that the the solo part's really beautifully and imaginatively played. Because we come from the point of view of, <coughs> of trying to work out what relevance does a record company have in the 21st century, it, it's fairly clear that up to a point, the role of a 21st century record company is to find opportunities for the, the rules mm-hmm. of musical history. Because we can't go on recording Brahms. Yeah. It's just not possible. Yeah. Oh, we can do it, but it's it's just throwing money at a wall because nobody needs any more Brahms in, yeah. in general. And so it's it's interesting as we move into this position of saying, well, who else was, if you like, the second eleven or even the third eleven that mm-hmm. forms the pyramid over over which Brahms clearly stands as the as the dominant force. 
or you would pick Mala or whoever, mm-hmm. whichever whichever culture you're working in. Um, and I think as, as one puts out more and more of these people, your point about becoming familiar with the language is terribly important in order to give them a fair chance. And also having a calm attitude, I think, to accepting that these are not often capable of writing many enduring masterpieces. You like the violin concerto mm-hmm. on this Brule record, so do I. Mm-hmm. Some of the other works are simply pleasant and well-crafted. Mm-hmm. They're not great. Yeah. And one has to be calm and relaxed about that. If, if they, One would like to think if they had been capable of writing works all the time at the level of a Brahms, mm-hmm. they would have stayed in the repertoire. But it doesn't mean to say that they're not capable of writing some things of, of great beauty. Yeah. I mean, Brahms and Beethoven are you know, right up there, the very select number of composers who, since their own lifetimes, it's generally been assumed that almost every piece is good. Yes. But, I mean, even figures as major as Dvorak, it's not always been the case. Now, Brahms rated pretty much everything Dvorak wrote. Yep. You know, but when I was, you know, going to music college, people would sort of say, well, you know, the Ninth and Seventh Symphonies are very good. The Eighth is pretty good. But who needs the it, others? Yeah. yeah. But then, you know, if you, if you, actually, you know, the Eighth is also really good. The Sixth is fantastic. The Fifth is really, really good. So thinking, well, actually, maybe they all are pretty good. And, and you know, you say, well, Carnival is great, but I thought that was also great. And yes, it Nature's is. Nature's Realm, also great. You yep. know, the symphonic variations are great. Um, I, you know, I remember people saying, well, you know, Mahler, you know, uh, yeah, the first and fourth symphonies are good audience pieces. The rest, nah, you know. Well, I mean, that, that doesn't happen anymore. But, of course, in the 50s and 60s, you'd be lucky to hear a good performance of a Mahler symphony. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took people a long time to figure out uh, how to bring those pieces off really convincingly. like Victor Willemont, who you've got coming out uh, mm. this month, who I think is a really, really major composer, really, really major composer, and would have been, you know, one of the absolute kings of the 20th century had he not died when he did. Well, let's move to that record, Songs of the Orient, uh, an, in, an interesting concept that Simon Rolfish put together, um, the, the, the momentary passion for German translations of Chinese uh, literature, um, really the, the the focus of one individual um, in Germany who published a volume of these translations and picked up by Mahler mm-hmm. famously um, and by quite a few other composers. This particular record dedicated primarily to those composers who wrote from that volume of poetry um, who either had a very, very, very tough time um, surviving the mid, mid-century in Europe, uh, or who in fact were victims of the Holocaust and, and the, the, the scourge of that time. Um, you've picked out Ullman. I would think I would counter by saying that I think the same is true of the Czech composer um, Hus. I think Pavel, Pavel Hus, a completely um, uh, uh, unequivocally a genius. Mm. Um, and what we, we can talk about them as individuals in a moment, which of course we should do because it's not fair to bracket them all as Holocaust composers mm. uh, or whatever crude appellation that one might put on this record. And in fact, Simon was very insistent that we shouldn't attempt to market or sell or promote this record with that as a primary objective. No. All of these composers were entirely their own people living in their own culture happened to be caught up in that moment. Um, But what would 
European musical history have been like if the Husses and the Ullmans had, con had continued on their trajectory and had become the dominant next generation following on from Strauss and so on. Um, would have been, we'd have been in a quite different place now, I think. Well, I think uh, the Central European tradition basically ended Yes, it did. With the Second World War. Yes, it did. And I don't think it would have no. had, had these composers uh, survived or stayed in place. And, and if, nurtured and if Gaal had stayed where he was yeah, in Austria. Was, Hindemith, and, yes. you know, an, another one, Krennic. Uh, all the emigre composers who paid a terrible creative price for trying to relocate and, and stay close to whatever inner spring fed them uh, after they, they moved. And Schoenberg's music changed a lot after he came to America. It's a huge, huge cultural loss. And I mean, thank goodness that over the last 30 years or so, uh, you know, thanks to the Entente de Musique series that Decca did, thanks to discs like this, at least we're starting to realize actually that not all is lost. A lot of this music does survive and, and really does uh, show that, that these were you know, incredible voices going yeah. in, in really interesting directions and in a way all dealing with this sort of fundamental creative crisis that dominated the 20th century which was once the atomic musical bomb of Schoenberg and Stravinsky went off and you, know, you had this huge explosion of potentialities of what music can be that composers like Ullmann and Haas a generation later were beginning to bring those innovations to assimilate yes to assimilate them and to reconcile them with the yes. tradition of Strauss and Mahler yes uh, in a way that I think is really successful from incredibly the audience point of view. exactly right if you hadn't finished that sentence with from the audience's point of view I would have done it for you mm. But it's so fascinating, these composers. They are so clean, so understandable, and yet so new um, at the same time. It's, it's an unending tragedy that we don't have more, but a great joy to discover and to rediscover what we do have. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, hats off to Simon for contextualizing the program in an interesting way. When we started doing the Gaal symphonies, the, the Gaal family were very insistent that we not turn this into a sort of series of Holocaust memorial concerts. Yeah. And they said, actually, you know, if you want to contextualize Scal's music, put it alongside Schumann, Schubert, Mendelssohn, Beethoven, mm -hmm. Haydn. That, that's, that's where he saw himself, and, and that's the context that his, his music belongs in. And I think that was very good mm. advice. And mm. uh, having just come back from conducting two performances of Das Lied von der Erde, you know, this was just absolutely wonderful to discover and see how you know, the influence of Mahler was, was also being distilled down and, and reimagined by the next generation of composers. It's an absolute joy to listen to these songs. Um, they, they are fresh as they could possibly be. Yeah. And, and all of them, utterly different from each other, and yet still within a general framework of a tradition that we understand. These are big personalities. You yes, know? they are. And uh, yes. Uh, you know, wonderful to hear the, the, the very beginning of the disc, Ullmann in, in slightly Kurt Weilish territory, a little bit mm. quirky and Absolutely. funny, uh, which is a, a side of his music you don't hear as much in the chamber music, uh, and which he does very, very well sort of sly wit is, it comes across amazingly well. Yes, uh, I think it's one of the one of the important releases that we've we've been fortunate enough to to have um, in the last uh, year or so. Uh, I I urge everybody to discover these composers for themselves. It's it, it has
helps to make sense of the middle of the century. talk a little bit about Philip Sawyer's before we wrap it up because that's the next one on, on my yes well list. I think we should because um, it's it's what brought Nimbus and Ken Woods together thank was, goodness was, yeah with Sawyer's um, and 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 also another great joy that one finds in our own midst somebody who is not only comfortable writing symphonies but also doing a very very good job, um, um, a modern contemporary emotionally fulfilling job of, of filling those apparently dead and withered art form you know, um, <laughs> shapes. Um, yes, let's talk about Philip. In a way, I think um, what we were saying about Haas and Ullmann very much applies to Philip. And I don't think there were a whole lot of composers between the 50s and the 70s who so successfully sort of were able to take Schoenberg's innovations and reconcile them with classical forms. Philip has this knack for using a huge breadth of languages in a way that's really coherent. Uh, we talk about early 20th century music and, and phrases like the emancipation of dissonance get used, which sounds like in a way you say, oh, we're freeing composers up to use dissonance in a much more creative way. Yes, but if you get to the point where music is only one color, then dissonance ceases to have any function or to be able to create any tension. Yeah, it's like swearing. Yeah. The yeah. more you hear somebody swearing, the less impact yeah, that yeah. moment of bad language yeah. has. Yeah. The one time I heard my grandmother swear, it right. made quite an impression on exactly. me. Exactly, yes. It was one word once, and I, I, my heart stopped for a second. But, you know, you hear you know, a drunk guy coming out of the pub, it's, yeah. it's not impressive. No. Um, so, yeah, Philip has a, an amazing knack of creating tension in the music and creating uh, drama. Yes, he does. In, in the music, uh, it was amazing to, to get to grips with his third symphony, which was the, the last disc we did together. Um, I think that's you know the great British symphony of our, our times, an incredible work, an amazing adagio in it. But, you know, uh, and the whole work, just so powerful, but uh, he's on an absolute roll. Yes. The next one is, is Concerto, so we've got uh, a very fiery concerto for trumpet, strings, and timpani uh, with Simon de Brule. Very lyrical and warm-hearted violin concerto with uh, Sasha Sidkiewicz. And then two shorter pieces, uh, an elegy for John McCabe for trumpet and strings, again with Simon, and a tone poem uh, based on the paintings of Samuel Palmer uh, called Valley of Vision, which I think is just an amazing work. And uh, uh, yeah, it's just wonderful to see a composer just in full creative flow the way Philip is right now. You yeah. talked about uh, you know, Thea's relocation to America in a climate in which her music wasn't necessarily welcome. Hans Gall dealt with the same thing in the 60s and, and 70s. 
uh, you know, the, he went from being regularly performed to just having yep. no prospect of performance or interest. Philip was a young composer in that, that climate. And, uh, you know, he was just basically told, you can't compose like this. It's not allowed. And uh, so he went into self-imposed exile in the Covent Garden Opera Orchestra and uh, you know, 25 years as a, as a violinist there, uh, I think, helped him in a way to learn all this incredible repertoire. And he, his... He's clearly soaked it up. He, yeah. it, it's something that is part of his, his being, and uh, not that he regurgitates, but he's familiar. He's familiar. He understands the language, the tradition, and the orchestra as, as an instrument yeah. incredibly well. Yes. No, and, and still, you know, young enough to, to be able to deliver a, a lot of work. Yes. Um, because he seems to be very fluent at the moment. Yeah, we just keep encouraging him. Say, Don't Absolutely. take any vacations, just keep writing. <laughs> you will have had the opportunity to program more of his music than most at this point. Have you seen... Well, how, uh, how do you see audiences react? First of all, how do they react when you put the name on the programme? You know, do your subscribers and the people who are buying tickets on a regular basis say, oh, I'm not sure, will I like it, perhaps I won't come? And then presumably you see the reaction after the performance of people saying, I'm very glad I came. Mm. Is, that, is that how it works? That is how it works. And uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, the first issue you speak to uh, becoming less of a problem because uh, more and more it's like green eggs and ham you know mm. you just have to get them to try it um, and but that's not true of all music and not, not even true of all good music there's lots of really fantastic music that you know unless someone has lived with the language long enough they're not going to get on first hearing right um, and that's fine you know but we shouldn't lie to them and say, you'll like this the first time off. But Philip's music, I think, is on the one hand, there's a lot of depth to it and a lot of originality in it for the most sophisticated listener, but it is approachable to, to anyone. Uh, you know, people were in tears at the premiere of Valley of Vision. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an incredible response uh, from the audience. Uh, likewise, the premiere of the Third Symphony. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done his song cycle, Songs of Loss and Regret, uh, a few times, and, you know, it, it, People are just mm -hmm. dumbstruck, and and, and the, the reaction to those works is the kind of reaction you get when you do vintage Mahler or something, you yep. know, sort yep. of overwhelming emotional yep. response to the music, which is so great to see. Well, good. I'm glad to see it. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have discovered Philip some years ago and uh, and to find that he has a champion in you means that we don't have to go chasing around uh, trying to persuade people to record it put it on programs and support it uh, yeah absolutely and I think gradually you know the network of people who know the music is getting bigger which I think will lead to more requests for more chamber music mm -hmm. uh, he did the fantastic disc with the Steinberg duo of his uh, two violin sonatas which are great pieces you know Hopefully there's more of that mm. to come. I, I agree. Uh, Ken, thank you very much for the coffee, for the podcast, for uh, allowing me to play with the dog. Um, <laughs> and I guess I'll be seeing you fairly soon. Um, both with the new recording projects that you're, you're going to bring to us and also some other things that we're working on. Sounds great. Thanks, Adrian.